Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always I will be the man with the questions. Today I am privileged to have Werner Vinge as my guest on the show. Known for his rigorous hard science approach, Werner Vinge first became an, an iconic figure both among cybernetic scientists and sci- science fiction fans with the publication of his 1981 novella True Names, widely considered to be the visionary work behind the Internet Revolution. Later, he gained even more public attention as a Hugo Award winner and the author who coined the term technological singularity in his science fiction novel Marooned in Real Time. So, without further ado, let me welcome uh, Professor Werner Vinge. Hi, Werner, and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Hi, Nicola. Uh, just before we jump into the questions, I want to share with uh, Werner and our audience that I've been actually suffering uh, sick for the last two or three days, and as a result of that, my voice may sound uh, rather different than usually, so I hope my listeners uh, can bear with that. So anyway, uh, but I wouldn't want to miss uh, such a rare opportunity as to interview uh, Werner Vinge, um, and uh, that's why I still decided to go ahead with the interview. Anyway, uh, let's begin with the first question here. Werner, can you tell us a little more about yourself and your background, but especially why and how you got interested in issues such as science and advanced technologies in general, and writing science fiction in particular? Well, since a, a young child, I've always been uh, uh, I- interested in things associated with, with uh, science. And uh, I remember that when I, I, I was actually rather slow to learn to read, um, my parents uh, told me that probably the first uh, book that I ever read all the way through uh, wasn't until the, the second grade or so. Uh, but that book was uh, Robert Heinlein's uh, uh, Between Planets. And one <laughs> thing that I noticed very early on was that it was very hard in the early 1950s to find stories where the world was different at the end of the story than it was at the beginning of the story. Um, you would occasionally find stories that seemed to be like that, but then at the end the character would wake up and it, all, it had all been a dream. Um, so the very rare stories that I could find in that era where the world was different at the end of the story than at the beginning of the story turned out to be pretty uniformly associated with the genre of science fiction. So basically science fiction was with me there from just about the earliest that I was uh, uh, able to um, uh, read and onwards. Um, the the uh, idea of writing science fiction kind of grew along the way uh, and became a greater and greater part of that, although I, I did continue with the, with, the, with the science background in college and, and, and got my doctorate in mathematics. Well, that's very interesting, but if I may, let me ask you, how did it happen in that case then you didn't just try and become a science fiction writer from the very beginning, but you kind of ended up being a, a professor of mathematics for about 30 years, as far as I know. Yes. And, and only um, towards the, the latter part of your uh, sort of university or professorship career, uh, I think you sort of started shifting your attention towards uh, science fiction writing. Uh, science fiction writing was always a hobby of mine. And uh, as I was uh, teaching full-time, that is, you know, academic year, um, uh, there really wasn't time to, to uh, uh, write very much science fiction. It was mainly during the summer vacations or during the Christmas breaks that I was able to write science fiction. So, uh, from, similarly in graduate school. Uh, so from the end of high school until the year 2000, basically this was a sort of a, a, a hobby, a background thing. And as, as hobbies go, I rather recommend it, by the way, since... Uh, there are many hobbies, well, most hobbies probably, that can become quite expensive. <laughs> and in the case of writing, it doesn't have to be expensive at all, uh, except of your time. And, and it has an upside. I mean, it's, 
it's uh, quite possible that uh, um, what you do will will be successful and so- somewhat successful monetarily, but also from the standpoint of of uh, getting to see and uh, people and talk about things that you wouldn't have had a chance to otherwise. So I'm very very glad that I had the ac- the academic uh, career. Um, it it certainly did dominate the, the, you know the work during those 25 or 30 years. Um, I had the idea that when I retired from teaching that that suddenly my writing output would go up correspondingly, and um, that's been one of the disappointments of the last 10 or 11 years is that my my writing production has uh, pr- probably increased somewhat, but it, it it hasn't increased by the factor of four that one might expect from just the the numerical ratio of times. If I may say so, though. Uh Quantity is not everything. The, the The quality of your writing is outstanding. So I think you're making up there, at the very Thank least. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you have a, a number of uh, very influential books. Um, I personally have read uh, three of yours. Um, and and uh, the, the latest one I read was uh, Rainbow's End. Yes. But but I started with, with uh, the book where you coined the term... The technological singularity, um, and this is how I got introduced to your work in general. Uh, so perhaps it is best to start our uh, the meat of our discussion here with uh, the Werner Vinge definition of what the technological singularity stands for, because there's you're the person who coined the term, and there's so many variations of it that I, I'd really like to to get yours again here for the record. Right, my. When I use that term, technological singular, technological singularity, uh, what I have in mind is the notion that in the uh, relatively near future, we can talk about that, um, uh, humankind will, using tech by using technology, uh, either create or become creatures of uh, superhuman intelligence, and there's various good reasons why techno- uh, singularity is, is a good good metaphor in, the, in that circumstance, uh, but it, 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 is, it is a type of change, a technological change, um, that is qualitatively different from the technological changes that we have achieved in, in the past, mm-hmm. and it's different in the following sense. Um, if... Um, uh, uh, singularity one-on-one could, by some magical way, um, interview Mark Twain. <laughs> um, you could describe to Mark Twain um, what our era is like and what's going on in, in our era. And he would understand what you were saying. Uh, and I think, actually, Mark Twain would be quite enthusiastic about it because uh, uh, you know, he really was a, a, a technophile. He was a um, techno geek, yeah. <laughs> yes, and you could you could actually do the same exercise with with people from even even fur, even further back. And yeah. You could describe our present situation to them as as long as you had a common language, and it's very likely they wouldn't believe you, but they would understand what you were saying if mm-hmm. you you know you could speak for an hour or two to them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been the form of technology, technological, technological change up till now. That uh, changes were great, or that is large. They were generally unpredictable, uh, certainly unpredictable in detail and often unpredictable in, 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 in larger ways. But they could be explained um, to people from before the change. On the other hand, if you tried to do the same explanatory exercise with a goldfish you you probably would not be successful if you tried to explain to a goldfish what was going on in our human world here today you uh, would would not be able to do that that is the difference uh, in terms of talking about and explaining things post singularity compared to now it's not merely a matter of prediction it's a it's a matter of the fundamental thing about observing the world has changed. And so, in that sense, the um, 
thinking of the term singularity as a metaphor. Um, it's actually a kind of interesting metaphor uh, by comparison with, um, uh, say, the, uh, the, uh, the singularity in physics that we get you know, near it with black holes. Mm-hmm. in which not very much information can be extracted uh, uh, about what's going on inside a black hole. That very, mind, very much reminds me to the, to the sort of a question metaphor of can a slug get Beethoven? Uh, and and, and yes. how, would, how would Beethoven sound to a slug, for example? I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm sure that the slug in, in his own mind, or like, I, I don't remember the number of neurons that they had, something like 50 or something like that, they would sort of perceive the, the, the sound waves right. as some kind of vibrations, right? Right. But, but <laughs> would that really amount to, to getting it? Like, right. Prob- probably right. You not. Can't ta- right? You can't take a slug to the, to the opera. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. So, so... Okay, so, so let me backtrack just a little bit here and see how that fits then. So, what is the motivation behind your work then? I mean, you started as a, as a child enthusiast of science fiction. You, you were a, a professor of mathematics for several decades. Then you devoted yourself full-time to science fiction. You coined the term the technological singularity. What is this all leading towards? What's the motivation and what's the goal, if, if there is any in the end? Uh, the, the personal goal, I, uh, in, in a large sense, is, is just getting some, making some sense of the universe. Um, plus, the, the wish for an optimistic view of the universe. Because this, uh, although uh, thinking about things that might be smarter than us is... is is, 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 a, is a topic that you can get nervous about if you expect it to happen soon. Uh, it, is, it is also overall a, an, an optimistic view of, of progress. So when I was growing up in the 50s, in the 1950s, the um, notion of progress was, was there, and in the science fiction magazines, there was um, a real effort to try to understand or see the limits of progress. And the more I read, and I think the, the, the more writers looked at this, the, um, the uh, wider the horizons uh, 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 seemed to grow. So in, in, by the late 1950s, in my personal evolution through this, um, I was looking for um, what sort of limits that there were on progress. And by that time, I have this great little book on my bookshelf, Automata Studies, edited by Claude Shannon and, um, uh, and John McCarthy. And uh, it, it, it really made an impression upon me at, at the time. And the first story that I ever, science fiction story that I ever wrote that sold um, was about intelligence amplification. And toward the end of it, uh, the cat is out of the bag in the sense that uh, it looks like intelligence amplification technology is, is going to go public. And a guy who was trying to stop it, stop that effort, made the comment that uh, he, he, this fellow was, a, was actually a general, a military general, mm-hmm. and he made the comment that um, uh, I, regard, I, I, I regard intelligence amplification as a... Um, uh, a, a true revolution in, in, in weapons, um, but it also puts puts the the issue beyond um, uh, the control of mere humans. And so, in a sense, my position in this story, the general says, is that is 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 that of an anti-militarist. <laughs> uh, now, in fact, if 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 uh, intelligence amplification. Uh, were used for military uh, uh, goals, it certainly would be a, a military thing and, and in a way, a, a type of showstopper. On the other hand, um, the, the military applications of uh, superintelligence is, is really, um, uh, if we can avoid the violence angle, uh, the, the military implications is really among the smallest impl- implications of, of uh, superhuman intelligence for the mm-hmm for the human race as a whole and for life in the universe as a whole. I will come back to to the military implications and and 
the sort of negative uh, potential scenarios of, of a singularity a bit later. But let me see how we can make sense of, or how I can make sense of, of what you just said in a single word. 